Well, good morning to everybody. It is a great day to be in the house of the Lord. I am excited. I am really wanting a sip of Josh's coffee because it looks good. <laughs> I mean, Justin's coffee because it looks good. And, and, and now your coffee. Coffee looks very good right now. Amen. Amen. Uh, this is a great day. Um, I'm excited about today's message. It is a beautiful message that I believe God has already placed um, in our hearts that we would just speak his word and just magnify it. Um, it is a great day. We are traveling through the book of Acts. We are still traveling through the book of Acts. The book of Acts is a beautiful book because this book shows us what is happening after Jesus has departed from us physically. Yes, he is with us uh, on the inside. His spirit lives on the inside of us, yet in this particular letter, we see 35 years worth of work in what is going on in the presence of the church when there is no physical Jesus present. How did the church expand? Actually, how did the gospel even get to you and I? And the reason the gospel got to you and I is through the power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the star in the book of Acts. He is the Steph Curry of basketball. It depends on what fans you're. Okay, I'll do for everybody. LeBron James of basketball. Whatever it is, he is the star. The Holy Spirit is the star. Nothing is happening without the Spirit. The Spirit is moving people to share Jesus. The Spirit is moving people to become uh, unified with one another. The Spirit is moving people to give. The Spirit is moving people to serve one another. The Spirit is giving structure. The Holy Spirit is the star of this entire letter, and quite frankly, the Holy Spirit is the star of our lives today. We cannot do anything on this earth without the power of God. And if we believe that we can, then that issue needs to be corrected because <laughs> nothing can be done supernaturally without the Spirit of God. So travel with me through the book of Acts. I'll be starting, well, I'll be finishing up chapter 4. And I will start at verse 32 on this morning. Acts chapter 4, starting at verse 32. Scripture reads, All the believers were united in heart and mind, and they felt that what they owned was not their own. So they shared everything they had. The apostles testified powerfully to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And God's great blessings was upon them all. There were no needy people among them because those who owned land or houses would sell them and bring the money to the apostles to give to those in need. For instance, there was Joseph, one of the apostles nicknamed Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. He was from the tribe of Levi and came from the island of Cyprus. He sold a field he owned and brought the money to the apostles. I would like to talk on the subject, a generous church. A generous church. In March 2020, there was a national emergency declared about our country being affected by what's now known as the coronavirus. Everything shut down. People were in panic. Um, people were losing their jobs. People were getting sick. Uh, people were dying. Families were being displaced, and they still are. 
it was a very bad time, and it still is, emotionally and also socially, people were being displaced. I mean, parents couldn't see their kids, grandparents, aunties, uncles, things. I mean, it was just a sad beginning of what this looked like. Families did not have money to feed their own children. I mean, imagine being a parent and you have a child to take care of and you cannot even put food on the table. That, I promise you, if, if you're not a parent, and if, or if you are a parent, and even if you're not a parent, that is a feeling that you do not want to experience. Some people could not even work. They couldn't even get a job. They, they were they were released from their jobs because their job had to shut down. Some people were able to get unemployment, some people were not. It was just a bad time for us. When things happen like this, it's very important that the church steps up to take its rightful position on earth. I was excited and motivated and energized when I saw a church by the name of Saddleback. They opened their food distribution center and served over seven million meals to people. Now this is an interesting operation now. You got to understand, serving seven million people is not easy. They set up the operation, and they fed people on a consistent basis all throughout their area. For some people, church shut down, but for Saddleback, it was just getting started. No, they didn't have a worship service, but they were still doing what the church was called to do, which was the love on people. They prayed through, how can they really meet the needs of the city that they were in? They even created a, a career coaching ministry to help people and walk alongside people to help them get jobs when it came time to get these jobs because they understand that restoration is not only being saved, but it's also about being able to provide for your family. It's hard believing in Jesus and doing what God has called you to do when you are financially stressed, when you don't know where you're going to eat. It is challenging, but not impossible. And so they decided to meet these needs. It was beautiful what this church did during this time, meeting the needs of people immediately. And quite frankly, that's what we see going on in this particular passage. They are coming together to meet the needs of the people that are around them. And it was prompted by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit gave them love. It gave them boldness. It gave them all sorts of things. And now they were inclined to meet humanitarian efforts, not just on the inside, but on the outside too. The Holy Spirit prompted them to be generous. Again, we're studying what's happening over 35 years of how this gospel exploded, how the Holy Spirit stepped in and everything just started happening out of nowhere. People started getting saved, needs were being met. And what I see here in this particular passage is that another principle that is happening with the church and that we need to learn from the first century and keep this same principle today, and that is to be a generous church. If we are not meeting the needs of the community, then we may need to check and see if we're really filled with the Spirit. There is a person in need amongst us. <laughs> we, I mean, if my brother or my sister was facing foreclosure or have no food on their table, could it be that we may need to come together as a church and do everything we can to help this family out? I mean, if you truly are my brother, do I not want to make sure you're good? 
If I truly am your brother, do you, if, if I am suffering from depression, do you not want to help me? We have to be able to meet the needs in the community. If I'm looking for a job and I can't find no job, I'm probably going to tell you to call Josh so you can get a job at J.C. Penn. I'm just playing. I'm just playing. I'm just playing. I would do you like that, Josh. But it's about meeting needs. It's about sharing resources within the body so that we can connect with one another and be able to help each other. That's what a generous church is doing. They're meeting the needs of people. And one thing that I see in verse 32 right there is that a generous church is unified. It says that they were united in heart and in mind. The, the church is unified. They have to have a common purpose to center around. And just to be clear, our common purpose, purpose that we center around is Jesus. No one else. They are unified. They are uh, collectively one one band, one sound. They are one. I was uh, checking out some, some stuff on the internet, and I saw, uh, I saw, a, it was 600 plus pianists, and they were all playing the same tune simultaneously at one time. Simultaneously, at one time, 600 people playing a piano. <laughs> Do you not? Okay. <laughs> the 600 people collectively playing the same tune at the same time. It takes a lot to do that. Well, one, I, so I'm looking at this and I'm like, how are they doing this? They're all spread out. They're all in different areas. And then I'm seeing this guy with this stick and he's doing this. Now, I, I am not that good with the whole, uh, you know, the musician piece, but I can catch on real quick. So I'm seeing this guy. He points over here. They do this. They point over there. They do that. They point over there. So I, I was like, who is this guy with this stick? Is he the stick guy? I could be wrong. But my research told me that he's called the conductor. So they had to have a conductor to help them stay on one accord. A conductor helped them stay on one accord. Watch this. Who helps keeps us on one accord? His name is Jesus. He keeps us on one accord. He has it and he's doing it. Just like that, watch this. I also notice that when you see these, um, these, these stands, they're called music stands. Yeah, okay. I, I'm not that good with that. But they have these pieces of paper, right, Bailey? It's, it's, it's pieces of paper on these stands, and everyone is probably reading it, and they're supposed to be singing it on the same tune at the same time. They're reading what it is they're supposed to be saying. Well, how does that relate to the church? We all should be reading the same Bible. This is what keeps us unified. The Holy Spirit as the conductor is leading us in the right direction. He is keeping us unified. We are being devoted to his scriptures and we're listening to what he is saying in his word and it is keeping us on the same page. Unified. Together, one. That's a beautiful sight to see when people are engaged with one another. It was a beautiful sight. If you get a chance, check it out. Just Google 600 plus people playing the piano at the same time. It's going to pop up. You're going to see them, how they're all engaged in the one. They even had another one with children. It's like 68 children. They built this one piano with a bunch of strings, and all the kids are in tune. These are kids. Okay, all right, let's. If the kids can come together and play a tune together, I'm talking about, I, I'm talking about kids, um, teenagers, uh, some of them look like they were like eight, nine, maybe six years old, and they're coming together, watch this, they're practicing, they're learning, they're probably coming to practice, but on that day, they were all able to keep the same tune. It was like 60 plus kids, or 80 plus kids, 
all on one accord. Well, that lets me know that unity can be accomplished even by a child. So what does that say about church? It takes discipline, it takes, it takes sacrifice, it takes humility, it takes being able to submit to a purpose, an idea, and in our case, that is God's word, that is who he is, that is the Holy Spirit, that is his scriptures, that is who we submit ourselves to, so that we can be unified. I'm sure people made mistakes when they were playing the piano, but you just keep going. You, you, know, you don't, you made a mistake on the chord. You, that's not how you get it done. You, you have to operate in love. A generous church is unified. Verse 33, I see this. A generous church, testimonies are magnified. Scripture says that their, their, their testimony was even more powerful. The apostles testified about the resurrection of Jesus Christ uh, even more powerfully. It was magnified. Interesting how generosity can lead to magnification of the gospel. Uh, I remember one day, about six months ago, uh, I, was, I was riding in my car at uh, my, my uh, one of my buddies with me, and we were riding through, and we saw this guy, and I was like, man, I want to share the gospel with that guy. And my, my friend, he was like, okay, cool, let's do it. All right, so I got out the car. We got out the car. We walked up to him. Y'all got to understand, this, 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 when you start sharing the gospel, it's, 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 it's kind of, it, it, you know, because he, he could have thought that we was, you know, these two guys just walking up to him and all that. And so I walked up to him. I said, hey, man, hey, man, hey, check this out. I got $20. I'll give you $20. Can I get 10 minutes of your time? I just want to ask you a few questions. That's what I told him. I had to, you know, I wanted to make sure he didn't think I was selling like vacuums and nothing like that. You know what I'm saying? I had to like get it down some. All right, so I offered him 20 bucks. He was looking at me like, you for real? I said, yeah, $20, 10 minutes, and we done. He said, all right, cool. I said, cool, man. Hey, tell me about yourself. Tell me about your childhood. He said, okay, yeah. Uh, you know, he started telling me everything that happened in his childhood. He was very open, by the way. He was like, man, I was raised by a single parent. I, you know, he, he, he really went into it. Okay, great. I did let him know, hey, I'm a pastor. I'm trying to get to know the community a little bit more, and I'm just trying to, you know, get, get, I'm, I'm just trying to learn people. He said, okay, good. Cool. cool. I said, man, tell me what you got going on now. He started telling me about his job. He started telling me where he is. You know, he travels a lot, all this good stuff. You know, I said, hey, man, so what, what, you, what would you like to do in about 10 or 15 years? He was like, man, I kind of want to own my own business. You know, I want to do this. I want to do that. You know, that's a good conversation. I said, hey, okay, so check this out. My last question, I'm done. Tell me what you think about the afterlife. He was like, woo! <laughs> he was like, man, that's a good question. He said, I grew up in church, but I ain't been going to church. He said, but that's probably why my life all jacked up right now. <laughs> Got all this stuff going on, man. I'm kind of stressed all the time. He was like, yeah, man, I, I probably didn't get back into church. I said, okay, bro, so, 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 so I said, God forbid if something was to happen today, you know what I'm saying, like, where do you see yourself in going to heaven? On a scale of one to zero, zero, zero to 100, where do you see yourself going? He was like, oh, I made about 70%. You know, like we predicting the weather. You know, like 70%. I was like, man, I don't know about that one. I said, I said do you want to be at 70%? He was like, no. I said, would you like to be at 100% today? He said, yeah. Cool. So I, start, I, I told him about the design that God had originally gave us, about how our relationship with him was just beautiful. And then I said, all of a sudden, sin, well, sin came into our earth and made it to this crazy world it is today. He was like, yeah, you ain't lying. This world is jacked up and all of this stuff. And I was like, yeah, man, we contributed to it. We, done, we, we made this earth the way it is today. And then I started telling him, hey, but there is a way that we can get back into the right relationship with God. And all we have to do is believe in Jesus and repent of our sins. And repent means just change your life. That's all you got to do. I said, turn your back away from the things that you're doing. And he was like, that is what it say. 
I said, yeah. So I said, you do not have to be at 70%. You can be at 100% right now. All you got to do is say, I believe. And that I want to change my ways. I want to commit. That don't mean everything going to happen just like that in one day. That just means that you're going to make a commitment. He said, man. I said, are you ready to make that commitment? He said, yeah, I'm down. I said, great. Well, let's pray. Watch this. He reached back in the pocket. He said, hey, man, here's your $20 back. <laughs> He said, here are your $20 back because you just gave me something that I needed way more than this. That's what he did. Generosity can magnify, can amplify your testimony. You know, I was telling y'all about Saddleback Church, how they, um, it was like 7 million pounds of food, 6 million meals. Um, they even, uh, would celebrate recovery in their church, they got up to like 17,000 people online doing celebrate recovery. And, um, they had a lot of people in their career program, the career ministry. Watch this. That year, 24,000 people came to Christ in their ministry. This is not something I'm making up, and this is not 20 or 30 years ago. This is 2020, two years ago, when our country declared a national emergency. 24,000 people accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and personal Savior (laughs) because the church was engaged into generous acts within the community. Generosity leads to your the testimony of Jesus Christ being magnified. It's a beautiful picture, right? A generous church. Then our passage that we're examining today, it gives us an example of a man named uh, Barnabas. Barnabas is an apostle called by God, originally named Joseph. Um, And this is what he does. He sells his property. (laughs) Like, he sells his estate. Okay, I need y'all to feel this, all right? (laughs) What if somebody told you to sell your house and give all the proceeds to the church? Y'all gonna be like, man, y'all tripping. (laughs) I know some people gonna be like that. This guy, he he did it. He, He gave it all. God. Now, I want to be very clear. All right, that's not what I'm telling y'all to do. Okay? That's not what I'm saying. The, the, the method of giving is our method of giving. Giving is the principle. This was Barnabas' method. Everyone's method is different. His method, though, was to give it all. His method was to sell possessions to meet the needs of people in the community. There's also some, some commentary that even says that he had multiple properties. He chose, he chose to sell this one to give the proceeds to the apostle. All right? And again, that's another method. They gave the money to the actual apostle. So, that, so again, that's a method. So I ain't telling y'all to sell your stuff and give it to Ahmad. No, that's not, that's not what I'm saying. You don't give your tithes and offerings to Ahmad. You give your tithes and your offerings and your gifts to God, to his church, so that it could be generous so that it can win people for Christ, so that it can meet needs in the community. That's why we give. Who wants to be selfish and not give? To, if there's someone in need, why would we be selfish? Are we filled with the Spirit if we do not have love for our brothers and sisters? Whether they believe in Jesus or not, I should have the love of God on the inside of me to care about someone else. We got these organisms. So I'm holding it like it's an organism. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> this is an organism, right? Um, how one organism works is um, it, can, it, can, it can grow if it's feeding off of another organism, but it's not giving, thing, it's not giving anything back to that particular organism. That's called a parasite. A parasite feeds off another organism to get everything that it has. 
It doesn't give anything back in return. Just a side note real quick. Um, If you are in a relationship and you're the only one giving and the other person is not giving back to you, you're in an unhealthy relationship because the other person is is displaying attributes of a parasite. They only want to take from you, but they do not want to invest back into you. The same thing with your job, right? You could be going to work on tomorrow, and if you're this person that you go to work and you don't want to do no work, but you want a paycheck, you're, you have attributes of a parasite. You want the paycheck, but you don't want to do no work. That's, that's not... Quite frankly, that's not even a principle of God. God says this. God said in everything you do, do it as you're doing it unto Christ. So when we go out into the community, even as a person that is a, a worker or an employee, we should, be, we should be one of the best workers in that job because why? It can magnify our testimony. shouldn't be lazy in our jobs. We, 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 we shouldn't be lazy in our relationships. We shouldn't be parasites. And watch this, we shouldn't be even spiritual parasites to where we just take, take, take from God, but we never give anything back. Just take from him. I need this. I need this. Give me this. Pray for me. Sing to me. Teach, watch my kids, do everything, but I am not going to give anything back. That is a parasite. And God has designed it to where when we're filled with the Holy Spirit, everyone is giving in love so that we can meet the needs on the inside and the out. That is what a generous church looks like. That's the church that I believe God has called us to be, a generous church, a church that loves people, a church that is filled with the Spirit, a church that desires to meet the needs of people on the inside and the out, a church that desires to have the testimony of Jesus Christ magnified, a church that is united in one, a church that gives. That's what this church is. It's a very generous church. Yeah, it was 2,000 years ago, but I believe that that same principle can exist today. And that, watch this, the gospel will be unstoppable when the people of God come together collectively and meet the needs of people on the inside and out. Pray with me. God, you are awesome. You are great. Father, we desire to be a generous church. We desire to be a generous individual. We desire to be filled with your spirit. Father, if there is something on the inside of us that is not like you, would you please clean it out? Would you please empty anything that is not like you and fill us with your spirit? God, would you do that for us right now? Would you empty us? Let us unite collectively in unity, in heart, in mind. Let us come together, God, and glorify you. Father, we desire to be generous only because you said so. So, Father, would you do that for us on this morning? Convict us into change. Give us the same spirit that you gave Barnabas, Father. Let us make sacrifices for you so that we can glorify your name. We love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name I pray.